and welcome to Pop Screen, part of the Geek Show Podcast Network. On this festive episode of Pop Screen, oh yes, we are renewing our commitment for another year to cover the good, the bad, and the inexplicable of movies, either starring by or about pop stars, covering a range of music and cinematic genres from country and western to hip hop, from documentaries to science fiction. I'm your host, Graham Williamson. I'm a writer for thegeekshow.co.uk as well as Byline Times, and we are cult. And I've been joined this week by. Mark Harrison, I'm a writer for Film Stories, Vodzilla, and the Film Quiz Podcast, occasional quiz master too. <laughs> I've been suggesting we do this episode for a while, and I'm glad we're finally getting around to exploring the, the cinematic works of, of Gary Kemp from Spandau Ballet. I'm excited <laughs> to dig into his to his oeuvre from, um, from the craze to the hardest British bastards in the galaxy. Yes! I'm so <laughs> pleased you mentioned that. That that mockumentary about the Kemps that Reese Thomas did on the BBC a couple of years back is yeah. far, far funnier than it needs to be. Stunning. <laughs> but I suspect maybe not what we're going to be talking about today, possibly. <laughs> well, no, because but part of the reason uh, why we're doing this for episode is because as someone who grew up during the 90s the title the theme song rather of this movie is just inextricably linked with the concept of christmas number ones in yeah. my head. Uh, it is the bodyguard it does star gary kemp but more importantly <laughs> uh, it has whitney houston yeah but depending on who you ask it's more important <laughs> it's <good. laughs> yeah um Whitney Houston, Kevin Costner, a match made um, somewhere. <laughs> uh, a match made. Let's not, match made. you know, <laughs> let, let, let's not talk it up. The match has been made and here we are. Had you seen this movie before? Yeah, when I was um, much younger and we'll talk about um, how my reaction has, and my memory of it has changed to um, to revisiting for this for this podcast. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to say um, flat out from the top, like, this is ridiculous melodrama and it's also great. It's like it's it's also yeah. great popcorn entertainment of the kind you know they don't make anymore because everyone made fun of it at the time. So, so thanks yes. for that. <laughs> yeah, the, but, the modern sort of film culture debate seems to be ah the CGI blockbusters I like are pure kino, whereas the CGI blockbusters you like a product. So there is something quite salutary in going back and finding that time was you could have a big hit with a corny romantic melodrama that was somehow tonally just as insane as Thor, Love and Thunder. <laughs> well, quite right, exactly. You know, if it didn't end in a team up between, say, like, Costner and this, Patrick Swayze from Ghost, um, <laughs> DiCaprio from Titanic, then was there any point to it? But, you know, I, I mention those because it is it is a, a trend of things that are big, you know, big hits, big popular films that um, film culture is bad at. Just because it's it's so much a sudden fraternity, yeah. You know, it's like these these films. The the ghost is is a much better film than this one. Titanic is a more technically accomplished film than this one. I'll grant you, but it's it's a thing of the 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 demographics thing seems to rule out with these big discussions. But yeah, big nineties blockbusters is what we're here for. Absolutely, yeah, and and it was a blockbuster. It was huge, and it's written by Lawrence Kasdan, who, I mean, he's he's written many things, but he's always tied in my mind to one of the er texts of the modern blockbuster which is Raid of the Lost Ark so yeah. it, it's a film that has that kind of action movie momentum even though it is only intermittently an action movie. Yeah well do you know the story of how this, this script um, eventually got made it was it was written much earlier than it was actually produced <laughs> I, I know that he originally intended it, he wrote it in the 70s and he originally intended it uh, with Steve McQueen for the Kevin Costner role and yeah. Diana Ross for the Whitney Houston role. Yeah, so so that was in the, the bedded in from the beginning, it was going to be an actor and and a singer acting. Yeah. Um, Towards the end of the of the seventies, it was sort of set up for um for Ryan O'Neill and Diana Ross because they were dating in real life to play right. the project. Um, John Boerman was attached to direct around then as well. Oh and... my god, I'd have <laughs> loved to see that. <laughs> well, you know, we'll we'll get to who directed it, and that's another <laughs> yeah, another nice what the fuck thing. Um, but that that sort of version of the project fell apart when when O'Neill and Ross um broke up, and it just sort of went in in Kasdan's draw. 
Um, mm-hmm. It was just a, it was kind of a early script that he was proud of, but just kind of sat there. You know, it got rejected lots and lots of times, which becomes a recurring theme throughout the production of this in a way. But it's it's um, it's in his working relationship with Kevin Costner that this comes back around because um, he first um, uh, f- first sort of worked together. Like Costner's in um, the Big Chill, but was cut mm-hmm. out. Um, and then they worked together on Silverado. And um, it was around that time Costner reads the script. The script that um, Kasdan has in his draw and says, I love this, but I can't get it made. If it's getting rejected everywhere, I can't get it made yet. But he keeps it in mind. So mm. when it gets around to like early 90s, like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is a big hit. And he sort of gives Wolves, him... Dances with the Wolves, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it gives him the clout to do more or less whatever. And, and, and with the... I think I don't know whether it's just it's a, it's a kind of um, method acting, but he's he becomes very protective of Whitney Houston, who winds up being cast in this film. He wants to cast someone who is a singer acting, as was always the plan. Mm. Um, but you know, his his thing became we're going to cast someone, and you know, it's from his point of view as having directed and edited, being notoriously like quite hands on in post production. His thing was you know we're going to make you look great was his assurance to Whitney Houston, who'd never acted before. And the film kind of attracted this, you know, the, the inevitable knives out from um, the film press and from tabloids. Oh, yeah. Because of, because of the whole um, the celebrity aspect that I'm sure we'll we'll get on to talking about as we as we go through. But, yeah, it's this thing of it was just around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, have you heard some of the people who were like, they were looking at casting in the female lead opposite Costner? Uh, other, other, no, Ross was the yeah. only alternate choice I heard about. Yeah, so for the Costner version, various people were considered. Um, there's Pat Benatar, Olivia Newton-John, uh, Madonna, who was reportedly ruled out because she was rude about Kevin Costner in, in an interview. He ah, was like, well, <laughs> yeah, we'll get on to that, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, John Jett, Debbie Harry, Janet Jackson, Terry Nunn from Berlin, um, Kim Cannes, <laughs> and uh, Dolly Parton, who, of course, ended up having an influence on the film. In a different of course. Way. Yeah. yeah, I I am I am wild for the idea of the John Booman directed Debbie Harry starring version <laughs> of the. I don't know who the male lead would be in that. Maybe the big stone head from Zardos could be persuaded <laughs> to come out of retirement. <laughs> um. Why not? Um, <laughs> but yeah, but despite all of that, there was um from from. Early 1991 onwards, you know, as I said, the script got rejected from a lot of studios. But when Costner had got it set up at Warner Brothers, he then set about going after persuading Whitney Houston to star as as the female lead, and was turned down a lot of times. You know, with with things as they were, with the speculation around her, you know, he was trying to persuade her to, you know, like try act and do this. This is going to be this is going to be great, and she took yeah. a lot of persuading apparently because there was um all sorts of scuttlebutt around the time. Okay. I mean, what one of the things that Kasdan said about it, and I assume this is why, you know, he clung on to the script when it seemed to be an unmakeable, uncommercial prospect, is he says that the film taught him economy in writing, which, mm. you know, is all over Raid of the Lost Ark. It's one of the most beautifully function functional screenplays in the world, that in yeah. every time indiana jones gets out of a problem it lands him into another problem and it's just Mm. a a model of good action movie writing but as someone who came to this for the first time uh when i uh in in order to record this podcast i thought that i had that quote about economy in my head all the time because the opening of this is so weird it starts off with kevin costner as frank the bodyguard of the title apprehending a guy who looks like killer bob from twin peaks (laughs) and it it happened so suddenly that i thought have i got a hooky copy is there meant to be more like before this that i've missed but no And then it cuts to a scene where a bomb goes off. And as soon as the bomb goes off, it cuts to Frank in his garden, listening to walk away with an A by the left bank. And it's like something out of Brazil. It's like a super <laughs> compressed kind of chain of uh, dramatic events that uh, it, it's just, like I say, it's such a tonally strange film, particularly for something that in its time was so mainstream. It, it now appears like you're watching the film on fast forward i guess i guess it wouldn't appear strange if i'm watching it as a blockbuster but 
there's a point where you can't watch a romantic drama like this is a blockbuster nowadays because it doesn't resemble what a blockbuster is anymore. So I'm, you know, sat here watching this thinking it'll be something like, I don't know, what's, what's a recent romantic film? Uh, Ali and Ava, maybe. Mm. <laughs> and, and I'm getting this. And I am just feel like it, it's, it's hurling stuff at me, not unpleasantly, <laughs> but in a really disorienting way. Yeah, I mean, the, the the two things, if you were going to put on a coat of arms for 90s cinema, would be <laughs> cocaine is a hell of a drug. And <laughs> it could be more than one thing. Like, those are the, yes. two, the two things. I mean, Ghost is, is full of that. Ghost is all over the shop uh, with, you know, supernatural stuff, romance. And, you know, while romantic drama and, you know, chick flick, the label is that, that, that comes into this, this also attempts to be a whodunit, but it's a whodunit that changes horses halfway through. Where the, oh boy, where yes. The, it, the, so the, the plot is that, you know, there's a stalker who's sending threatening letters to, to Rachel Marin, Whitney Houston's mm. character. And, um, you know, her team are aware of this. She has not been made aware of this um, because they don't want to put her off what looks like a rigorous tour and promotional schedule. Like Gary Kemp plays um, Cy, the sort of, the sort of, um, the, the <laughs> cringeworthy manager. Type Cy, like... who uh, I read a comment uh, somewhere about Cy where it said that Gary Kemp is one of those British actors whose British accent sounds like an American actor putting on a really <laughs> bad British accent, and it's yeah. very true. Here. Yeah, it's him and um, like Charlie Hunnam, like people who don't. <laughs> yeah. So you know, this um, so the the plot is that is that there's a stalker who's sending out these, you know, cutting. You get all these shots, you know, mm. of um, whoever it is cutting letters out with. Um, newspapers and sending like you know threatening letters to Marin bitch and all this kind of thing but then that's not like the climax of the film that guy gets caught off like off yes. screen halfway through the film and which is mental um and it's 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 just it cuts away to this guy who's um I'm gonna have to look up the name of the actor but um this guy who's got wild hair and is, is just <laughs> is it but you know it seems fundamentally harmless compared to you <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy who comes in is just an, an ex because um, you should mention that Frank Farmer Kevin Costner's character is an ex secret service man about halfway through the sort of mm. this love triangle thing set up with this obviously creepy man <laughs> played by yeah. Tom Serrano yeah this obvious creep <laughs> who you know who there's this weird jealousy backwards and forwards going and then th- there's this action packed climax where this guy is suddenly not the, not the guy who's originally threatened an air it's just it's bizarre and then the provenance of that like where he comes from who hired him to attack Rachel is all it's as you said it's, it's it's thrown at you in the middle of this it's it, it it's, really you know, it's, goes through. yeah and you know it, it does sell that guy as a plausible threat there's a lovely scene where in a news report about Rachel Marin's Oscar campaign yeah. is overlaid by this strange creaking noise and it's only after the camera sort of moves back that you realize it's him like with this rusty pair of scissors laboriously <laughs> cutting out the the raw material for his latest threatening letter it's like every now and then because this film was such a hit and because it's so nostalgically remembered there is talk of a remake and i do think that scene would just not be as good if it was just someone writing maven you bitch on twitter i don't think that would hit in the same way I think that is going to be the big. I mean, I've I've got some thoughts about the idea of remaking this. But we'll, 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 get, we'll get to that. But you're right. I think Twitter will be the thing that, that changes. Yes. Um, you mentioned the Oscars thing. Mm. I, I, I kind of really want to jump ahead to the Oscars thing because the it's Oscars amazing. thing is bananas. It is absolutely <laughs> bananas. The climax of this film takes place at the. It's almost like you know. There's so much. Um, I was going to say about about Gary Kemp and about Whitney Houston. And this. I think there's like a little. So their performances, I think there's a certain amount of like inside baseball, like they've met people like this in the industry or they're they're under these pressures yeah, in yeah. the industry. And it's almost like the film swings back the other way. It's just Kevin Costner kind of like, What can I relate to? Um, let's go to the Oscars. <laughs> and it's, and let's let's go to this mad Oscars ceremony. And it's, it's it takes place in our alternate universe where Whitney Houston is called Rachel Marin, Kevin Costner is a bodyguard, not a movie star, and Robert Wool is a big enough star to host the Oscars. <laughs> and, of, we... of course it's not even the Oscars, is it? It's just you, you they they have to cut around the fact that the after the terrible 1966 film, The Oscar, which we have covered on a 
Patreon show, oh. uh, the Oscars became very cagey about licensing any of their trademarks for movies. Yeah. And this just about gets around it because I think at this point, Kevin Costner could pull enough strings to like get a replica of the Oscars ceremony achieved without anyone crying foul but it, yeah. it's a sort of carefully off-brand oscars with as you say stars who were nowhere near big enough and it's a shame because <laughs> when the uh, spoiler alert when someone does take a shot at rachel Marin at the ceremony I, I just i just wanted there to be a gag where like costner pushes her aside and it's revealed that the bullet hit billy crystal or something <laughs> Yeah, if it's just if it's just major celebrities getting whacked <laughs> at Trade Centre as collateral damage in this um, romantic melodrama between between a woman and a bad bodyguard. No, I mean it, it's in this sequence as well that you also get Nathaniel Parker cast as um, cast as a. I want to say just based on who Costner have been working with, I think this is like what he thinks Alan Rickman comes off as. <laughs> And I know, he, I know. In fairness, right? He didn't write. He didn't, you know, as far as we know, he didn't direct because he didn't like do anything in post production. But you know, it's it's. He comes off like the the way they do the British diplomat in the West Wing. He says things like <laughs> he says things like, "Come, Rachel, let us brighten the firmament." But like, yeah. as I said, I watch. I did watch this when I was younger, and honestly, it was it came at such a moment of high tension, and he was so suspiciously off. But the first time I saw it, I thought, he's not British. Run, Rachel, run. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it's him. He's done it. He's pretending to be British. <laughs> you know, but then, the, you know, with the, with the intriguingly off thing, as you say, it could be that the entire thing is just an odd ruse that's put on a fake Oscars. <laughs> that, would, that would have been a fucking, that would have been that a better ending. That would have been a good twist. Well. Yes, it, absolutely. It, it, it's sort of what they did. A nice touch is that um, the seat fillers and the people being given awards on screen are all members of the cast and crew. So they all oh, get to good. kind of doll up and um, do an awards night that this film um, didn't really actually receive when it came out. Um, but it has, I mean, the other thing, the reason you can't remake really this now, we've just, we're just off the back of the Will Smith and Chris Rock incident. Imagine the think pieces. If at the Oscars, yeah. someone shot a cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, spoilers, by the way. Um, so anyway, it would, <laughs> so I, think that, I think that would go down better because you know nobody cares about the cameraman. If Will Smith had lamped a cameraman, <laughs> we we wouldn't know about it to this day. <laughs> I mean, we might if if an angle suddenly went off. But it was... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, um, I'm just getting that stuff out of the way because I think the main thing to talk about is is Whitney Houston and. And and Whitney Houston's performance in this, because as I say, there's um, so on Costner being protective of her. Mm. There was a, a few aspects of this. So um, because Costner had already done done some reports, he had it written into his contract that he could recut the film if he didn't like the the first cut. That the sorry, we got to get in who the director is. Who's the director of this one, Graham? <laughs> Oh, uh, it, it's Mick Jackson. So let me just look up what other uh, <laughs> timeless, heartfelt romances he has done in his career. Threads! Threads! <laughs> <laughs> it's not just threads. When you look at his TV work, it is the toniest stuff you can imagine. Not just threads, but connections with James Burke, The Ascent of Man with Jacob Bronowski, yeah. uh, the classic miniseries, A Very British Coup. Uh, one of Channel 4's first sort of big dramas. Uh, and then his, his film work is like LA Story, Volcano, this. There, there comes a point where he's clearly sat there thinking, I nuked Sheffield. I can, <laughs> I can afford to just sit back and cash in for a bit, just make a bit of fluff. <laughs> well, I think it's a... I mean, Kasdan was offered, you know, um, because he was co-producing it with Kevin Costner, Costner said, "Why don't you direct it?" And I don't know if it's partly because he's like, "I don't." He, what the reason he gave was the logistical challenges of creating it. What it might have been is, I, I know Kevin Costner, and I might not be the director <laughs> of this film by yes. the time it gets through post-production. But um, the thing I wanted to mention about the contractual thing is that um, so he had it written into his contract that he could have another bash at the thing. And when the first test screens first came out, there was notes back from the test audiences about. Whitney Houston's performance that Costner felt was fixable in the edit. And, you know, mm. so it goes. It's that the, the second run through after that test screening was more focused on 
um, sort of smaller emotional moments rather than big over the top melodramatic monologues that lend themselves to to melodramas like this yeah. particular one. You know, so there's um, you might also uncharitably say that you know, as you mentioned, that opening sort of stuff with with Frank kind of pottering around doing his thing. Yeah. It sort of like weights things towards him as well, including the sort of um, hilarious date thing that happens in the middle where like Costner becomes <laughs> the only man ever to get any <laughs> after taking someone to see your Jimbo for the 56th time and taking her home and showing <laughs> him his sword. <laughs> well, well, you were, were getting nominated for Oscars. I was learning the blades. <laughs> it's... it's Mental. And it's a little on the nose. He says something you see like 68 times. And, and, and it, that's, it's, that's probably it's, a bit of a self insert from Kasten because he said Yujimbo yeah. was the film that inspired him to write this. Yeah, that's fair. And, you know, it, it does literally translate to Bodyguard. It's just a little bit on the nose. It's it's like finding out that Matt Hancock had seen Parasite 68 times because he is one <laughs> and took a date back to show her the poor Korean family who hide in his basement. <laughs> Um, yes. But you know it, it, it's in there, so it's, it's the it's this big mix of like ludicrous romantic beats. I, mm. I I don't think that there's the, I think that there is chemistry between them. I think there is. I think you can see there's an, a bit of an imbalance in the in experience. Yeah, I would say. But I think the, the romantic aspect of things works because it's played up as she's not interested in him at first, and she is an inconvenience to her. And that by contrast, um, mm. her sister is quite into him. Like it's quite blatantly into him from the very yes. first time that they meet. And that's played up all the way through it as well. I think without knowing exactly what was tweaked after those test screenings, I would guess that once it gets to the midpoint and it starts to really slow down and concentrate on Frank and Rachel's relationship, yeah. that was probably one of the bits that needed adjusting because that is stylistically so different from the beginning. I think the, the beginning part of it is the most fun, but it's also yeah. the part where you can sort of see that Whitney Houston isn't an actress because she's being asked to do all of these really quick changes. Like the bit where she's she's relaxing in a garden and f- people are like putting in a new security system behind her and yeah. she has to go from relaxing in the garden to being really stroppy and yelling at the builders in uh, incredible time and that's not that's not really her fault it's the fact that the screenplay is so insanely accelerated but a more <laughs> practiced actress would be able to like find a way to make that more believable but when it gets onto the slow bit in the middle, yeah, I, I think she's pretty good. You know, I don't, I think having her play a character who has been nominated for an Oscar is just pinning a massive kick me sign to her back. Yeah. But, you know, she's not bad. Yeah. And it is a, you know, it's a production that was, as I mentioned, just because of the media circus kind of mm. target there, a lot of paparazzi, like sort of besieging. The production there was a lot of stuff going on for her personally in the background of it as well um yeah but you know on the um you know aside from costner kind of going after saying seeing you know she'd be great in this as far as he was um concerned there's obviously the soundtrack side of things so this film has the best selling soundtrack album of all time um soundtracks yes. produced by yeah david foster so there's um reproduced the soundtrack uh there's six songs from whitney on there there's uh covers of um, well, there's uh, the original songs of "Run to You," "Queen of the Night," and "I Have Nothing." Um, then there's covers of "I'm Every Woman," uh, the hymn "Jesus Loves Me," and of course, "I Will Always Love You," originally by mm. Dolly Parton. Indeed, yes. Uh, which eight uh, Christmas record sales in the UK? Um, yeah, there's there's some interesting songs on it uh queen of the night is interesting because it's very much in that kind of early whitney i want to dance with somebody style and as such it it sits a bit oddly into this i can't imagine what kind of celebrity rachel mavin is where she's taking time out from doing her oscar campaign to do a sort of sexy aerobic slash metropolis themed <laughs> music video to yeah. this disco song. It feels like you're looking inside Madonna's fantasy of what she would like her dual acting and singing career to go like rather than the uh, 
often unfortunate reality. Yeah, I did think that was a very good pastiche of, you know, then contemporary mad over the top music yeah. videos, you know, all those aesthetic choices. I think the fact that she's doing that alongside the Oscar campaign is to talk is speaks to, you know, what Whitney Houston's real schedule was like, you know. Yeah, you know, I guess. But, yeah. But on either side of this there was, you know, World Tours, you know, b- before like filming started and then afterwards for the bodyguard world tour because the <laughs> album was so was so big. Um, yeah. So that's all in there. Um, on the I Will Always Love You thing, it wasn't even originally meant to be that in the film. It was going to be, because um, they sort of, it's when they go on that date, they have the, it comes on the jukebox and then she covers it at the end of the film. The song yes. was going to be What Becomes the Broken Hearted, um, which Paul Young covered and featured in Fried Green Tomatoes around the same time. So they basically ah. lined up a bunch of other songs for Costner to choose from and he chose um, I Will Always Love You. Instead, it's like it's reportedly his idea to open for her to begin the cover a cappella as well. Right. It's like for the first however many seconds of the first first or so of that song, it's just a cappella. But I'm loath to giving him too much credit for how she actually does it because, good God, it's like that's the thing on which everyone agrees about this song is fucking hell, she had a voice, you know, it's, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's yes. her, her voice is like an instrument to the way she, like, you know. In that song, the words I and you are single words, single syllable <laughs> words, and each of them comprise like actual fucking vocal ranges all the way through that song. It's indelible. Yes. Yeah, the, it's, it's the iconic the thing ever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's fascinating as a sort of as what I started this podcast for, really, as a sort of funhouse mirror version of what Whitney Houston was living through at that time in her music career. I haven't seen, I don't know if you've seen, I haven't seen any of the posthumous documentaries about her, which had like two noteworthy British directors. There's a Kevin MacDonald one and there's a Nick Broomfield one. And I'm afraid I haven't seen either. I've seen the Kevin MacDonald one, um, right. which is the, the authorised one of mm. the two and um, wasn't able to catch up with the, the Broomfield one before this, but it's, I think in the the thing I would say about about when Houston's media image before and after a fucking tragic death um, is mm. that is that you see this thing that um, showbiz journalists have where they're very slow to they're they're not quick to collect, correct the record and if something happens that contradicts it they just sort of fold it into the shit they were already saying before and yeah. looking, even at the receptions for these two documentaries the the authorized one which has which has quite cagey interviewees mm. for like understandable reasons when it gets on to things about you know drug abuse and stuff and and um, uh, you know Bobby Brown see, comes off a little bit standoffish in terms of you know or a little bit cagey yeah about talking about any of this when asked um, but the authorized one I think I keep saying authorized because it's the one that was made in cooperation with the, the family and the estate well well it is it's important because the, that... the Broomfield one like I say I haven't seen it but I am aware that it goes into a few areas regarding her personal life that were yeah. not public domain when she was alive but yes carry on yeah but that's what I mean that from the sounds of it the one that was unauthorized that sort of like looked at you know gathered evidence as a documentary might was kind of decried as, you know, oh, speculative. She wasn't like this. It was because of this. And so, yeah. of, you know, this. I was looking at com- and comparing the receptions of these two documentaries and both of which saying, oh, it's almost as if there's some unknowable part of her life that the film doesn't quite get at, as if that's a bad thing as opposed to what should fucking happen with the race that they should be able to have a fucking private life. You know, there's, yeah. um, the, the Broomfield one's kind of based from backstage footage um, from a tour she did in the 90s, kind of like it still has an incomplete picture because you know you don't have the participation of, of certain interviewees whereas McDonald's was kind of commissioned by Nicole David who was who was Whitney's agent who basically mm. according to Kevin McDonald said she didn't understand why Whitney Houston ended the way she did and wanted to find out and it's sort of the documentary is almost staged as a mystery film in that way that sort of implies around the idea that she was secretly gay and that mm. she had affairs with um, with Robin Crawford, who was a childhood friend, which is it's it's again it's it's a thing of like you look at 
um, so sort of in reading for this, I've read an interview she gave to Ebony magazine in 1991, where she directly addressed this stuff as it was happening contemporarily. Like there was rumors about her and Robin Crawford having yeah. an affair. There was also rumors about um, about Eddie Murphy having fathered a, his fathering a child of her, and then she's dating the quarterback. And all of this stuff, the quote that she gave is, um, picture this, you wake up every day with a magnifying glass on you. Someone is always looking for something. Somebody somewhere is speaking your name every five seconds of the day, whether it's positive or negative. Like my friend Michael Jackson says, you want our blood, but you don't want our pain. And it's a thing of, it was, it was obviously, this is before she was she went on to be in the bodyguard. And he, as you say, a funhouse memory of everything that was going on, the absurdity yeah. of it all. But the absurdity should be in the melodrama. The stuff that's closest to reality in this shouldn't isn't right. <laughs> is, what, yeah. is, what, is what we keep have to keep going back to over this. Um, and in terms of you know the the approved documentary versus the the other one, the receptions of those. The other thing that is coming forward that we haven't seen is that at the time of recording this, we're about a week off. I want to dance with somebody um, from uh, Wesel yeah. Gummidge down under direct. I'm sorry, writer. From Wesel Gummidge down under writer Anthony McCartan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the trailer went with from the writer of Bohemian Rhapsody, <laughs> but yeah, it looks to be hitting, looks to be hitting all those beats. But you know, I've, I've, I've only seen the trailer. This might just be how you market these things. And the director is Casey Lemon, who's amazing. So I'm, I'm not going to yes. talk too much shit to her. And Naomi Yaki but... too, who I think is yeah. one of those. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, newest addition to my good in everything list. Naomi Yaki, I think she's great. Yeah, this looks more like towards the end of music biopics. I don't like just I'm just basing yeah. it off the trailer, but maybe they're just doing it. That's what everyone wants to see. So I'm not talking too much shit, even though you know they're also alongside this film releasing a Funko Pop vinyl figure of Whitney Houston. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, I want to dance with somebody merchandise, and the commodification of it all is a little fucking gross. As always, got to say, I mean, we, we've talked smack about the idea of a remake because Twitter wouldn't have the same impact, but I think you would definitely understand a bit more of Rachel Maron's stress and feelings of imprisonment if she found a Funko Pop of herself in her stalker's <laughs> apartment. Oh, there are, yeah, there are definite things. They were like, this, I would love to do that for someone to treat those featureless fucking gonks, <laughs> those <laughs> landfill merch things as, as a horror, <laughs> as a horror <laughs> reveal. It'd be amazing. I'm, I think a remake would be a good idea, as, as, as I'll get on to, but it, around... You know, separate from the film, I think the, the you know, the estate approved biopic that's going to do all the Bohemian Rhapsody sort of beats. Mm. Um, I felt a bit icky, even when I see the trailer for that. I mean, because it's, and it's a, it's one of these things which is like, you know, there's been a wave of these with varying degrees of, of success and quality, stuff like Elvis and Blonde that kind of like make the stories about the people who were exploited. Mm. But we're not exploiting it. No, 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 <laughs> sir. And in fact, in the Bohemian Rhapsody vein of things, you're just going to sort of square things down into a into a narrative arc um, that yeah, ultimately guess. makes people feel good and not like they're exploiting a person. <laughs> I, I, I see what you mean. I, I must admit, I am starting to look more fondly upon the classical sort of trad biopic after suffering through some of the attempts at experimental biopics we're getting this year. I am... A blonde, I, I thought, was a beautifully made, very adolescent film. Uh, Emily is like, <laughs> Emily's amazing because she's like, what if Emily Bronte actually lived in a shit knockoff of Wuthering Heights? And you think, hmm. well, that would be bad. Uh, that would be my answer to it. That would be bad and you shouldn't make it. Oh, you have. Oh, well, <laughs> that was a mistake. It's still going. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, it's. You know, there was with the media circus and everything that there was, and, and then going into you know, um, a marriage to, to Bobby Brown after that, mm. where there was various you know, reported instances of, of domestic abuse, of drug abuse, and all the rest, you know, sort yeah. of, and the, the circus sort of reaching its height with the reality show that he made. Do you remember being Bobby Brown? Did you ever see oh, any of this? It was God, a show that was yeah. nominally about him, in which he appeared as much as she did and didn't get a second season. Sorry, she appeared as much as he did and didn't get a second season because she declined to be in another one. And it, it was part of that kind of early to mid naughty cycle where people thought, oh, the Osbournes has been a good hit. Maybe every celebrity who's had a drug problem would make a good reality star. And you think, yeah, keyword here, yeah, had. It's yeah. less entertaining to watch them actually go through this shit. 
Yeah. And the horrible sobering thing in the, you know, not inevitable end. Obviously, it's, mm. it's none, of, none of this is fucking inevitable. No, no. It's just the thing of the, the sobering end that she came to, the fact that she, she died aged 48 in the hotel where she was about to go to a pre-Grammy party, the, the, the Beverly mm-hmm. Hilton. And, um, you know, she was discovered that afternoon. And instead of cancelling the party, that party became sort of an impromptu tribute while her body was still in the building, four floors of rock, like, hell. instead of cancelling the fucking thing. Uh, producer Clive Davis, played by Stanley Tucci, by the way, in I Want to Dance with Somebody <laughs> in cinemas next week. Uh, yes, yeah, so Clive Davis, I'm... also an executive producer on this. Oh, fancy that. I wonder if Stanley Tucci has uh, found Italy yet. <laughs> Because he's, he's on that show, isn't he, called Looking for Italy? In the episode <laughs> I saw, he stood in the middle of Venice, and I just wanted to shout, you, <laughs> you found it, Stanley. It's there. <laughs> Stanley, Stanley, turn around. Stan, you're missing it. You're just eating food. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, you know, um, anyway, back onto the bodyguard. Um, yes. It's a thing of, uh, you know, I mentioned that, this is one of these things that in pop culture, like Ghost Titanic, is sort of under underappreciated on those things. As you know, you can know something's ridiculous, like you can know any of the current crap of blockbusters is ridiculous, and it's mm. still really entertaining. And it's one of these things that is, you know, is so much part of pop culture in a way that a lot of films now aren't. But a lot of films that don't have, you know, someone in a in a costume in a superhero costume mm. won't be. You know, it's the it's the same reason everybody's undervaluing, like say Avatar, for instance, it's like, oh no, it has no cultural footprint. It's like we haven't talked about it in years. It's like, yeah, because the last one came out thirteen years ago. If you need yes. a diagram for me to show you why the most popular film of all time left a cultural footprint, I'm happy <laughs> to show it to you. Um but you know, getting off getting on to, you know, the the way this you know, that's a film that was spoofed, is what I'm saying. Avatar was fairly roundly like spoofed. And I think that's always the measure of something that cuts through. Especially this doesn't have any blue big tall blue people in it. <laughs> and yeah. You know, and you know, within a few years there's the I love the I always love the um like the third naked gun film is not the best one, but it spoofs the ending of this spectacularly with Leslie Nielsen running around on stage at the Oscars like it, it, in the orchestra pit. It was one of those delightful moments for me where I'd seen the spoof first and you do, when I was watching this I just had that sort of light bulb going on. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. There's um have you seen the one of The Simpsons where Homer goes to bodyguard school as well? Uh, I we... have, but I can't yeah. remember what the specific it's... Yeah, it's 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 Mark Hamill is in it. He plays himself, mm. but he also voices the Texan instructor at yes. the bodyguard school at home. Goes to it as a reward for graduating. I'm going to give you my take on a hit song from the most picture of the bodyguard. <laughs> I will always love you. And he just just <laughs> just it and falling to his knees while they all just back away. <laughs> We've talked, we've talked about this being a sort of reflection of Houston's public image at the time, but one of the things that I found really quite endearing is it is a fair, it is almost a spoof, really, of Kevin Costner's public image at the time. You mentioned mm-hmm. Madonna at the top of the show. The thing that most famously drove a wedge between Kevin Costner and Madonna is that famous bit in uh, Alex Kashishian's film Truth or Dare, uh, where Costner is invited backstage after a Madonna concert, and he says, so I, I thought your show was really neat. And Madonna just mimes vomiting because she's gone out there and done <laughs> mad acrobatic sex stuff in a Jean Paul Gaultier porn robot costume. And she has not done all that to be described as neat, neat. <laughs> but it's just such a, a Costnerish word. And similarly, when he's like coming onto the Queen of the Night video shoot to, to meet Rachel for the first time. They ask him if he wants a drink, and he says just an orange juice, and everyone just rolls their eyes at this sober prick they've got in the room. <laughs> and that felt that felt very deliberate to me. And I think with the amount of control Costner had over the project, he must have known that he is seen as this kind of Stanley Square jaw character by the public and is having a bit of fun with it, I think. Well, yeah, a, a fun fact on that, um, according to Gary Kemp, um, when when he met him on the set of this, Costner told him that, like, mine and my wife's song is true uh, by Spando Ball. I was like, oh, right, okay. And it's like, yep, there's, a, as you say, a Stanley Square jaw. <laughs> like, yeah. 
It's like, oh, well, you know, okay, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I like Costner. I, like, I quite like Costner. I think that, that, you know, he's on the road that leads him to Waterworld at this point, and I think that's madder. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, I, I just want to study stuff like that. <laughs> like this movie Star Trek of the early 90s. You know, yeah. like, um, he's, he's come off of, he's come off of um, being from Nanningham in um, <laughs> the of Peace. Also, yeah, I like Costner. I, I, I've ne- I've never seen any of this TV show that's somehow six seasons deep that is like um, the sort of like succession on a ranch Yellowstone. Have you ever heard of this? Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, um, yeah. It, it's what it's one of those things where I mean I would never say Costner was a favourite actor of mine, but I am mm. a huge Western fan, and he kept that genre alive when Definitely, it, yeah. any sane box office prognosticator would have told you it was going to die. You know, da- Dances with Wolves is maybe a bit kind of mockable Clinton evil liberalism in retrospect, but Open Range is a fucking great movie. Yeah. And yeah, I, I value him for that really. Yeah, all credit for that. I mean yeah, it's a you know they both they both ended up kind of taking their knocks when this came out. This is mm-hmm. um the this was the second highest grossing film of nineteen ninety two by the way. It was behind uh, Disney's Aladdin. So it was a big box office success but critically absolutely reviled. Um, and it's one uh, of those things where... Uh, stupidly. Um, I, 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 yeah, I disagree with that critical consensus to an extent, but I can sort of understand it. It's the same reason why, you know, stuff like Cocktail and Flashdance, which I think are, are both inferior to this, but why, why they got bad notices, because there is a... It's come to a point where critics are watching this and thinking... You know, is this the future? Are even small personal dramas about like falling in love or being a small town kid with a dream of even they going to be like lit and shot and edited like a music video now? And the answer is yes, as long as they're popular. You know, yeah. around the same time, if you wanted a, a sort of low key story of small town dreams, Abbas Kivastami was making the Coca trilogy in his native Iran, which I think <laughs> is stylistically very different to this. <laughs> but, you know, the, the ones that make a squillion dollars at the box office, yeah, they probably are going to be a bit more slam bang, a bit more corny, a bit more Hollywoody, because that's what blockbusters do yeah i mean it's the thing of um i should say to balance my earlier point i did find plenty of contemporary reviews by female critics who were saying that this was sort of bobbins as well and that's fair <laughs> enough but it is a thing of the you know the ever hilarious golden raspberry awards um mm. nominated this up the yazoo like worst picture worst actor and actress um and then two in the same category for worst new star uh for whitney and for kevin costner's crew cut ah my ick insides where to <laughs> with these amazing hyper specific jokes. Um anyway, so you know, obviously didn't make a massive movie star of Whitney Houston. That wasn't the immediate thing that she went on to do. But um I haven't seen any of other acting roles, but they're all kind of like on my watch list somewhere or other. She was next in uh Forrest Whitaker's Work into Excel, uh, uh... which is notable for Having an all African American cast this time, um, and then Penny Marshall. Hang on, hang on, hang on. It's it's notable uh, for me for I I haven't seen Waiting for Exhale. This might be a okay. Waiting to Exhale. This might be a completely unfair judgment, but when Bell Hooks died, I rewatched a, a sort of critical video that she made about African American representation in cinema, and she was just talking sort of quite journalistically about how much it was praised before it came out as a landmark for black actors and directors in Hollywood. Mm. And then she just paused and went, and I saw it and shit. (laughs) (laughs) I I really admired that it got bell hooks to break character for a bit. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) fair enough, it might be true, might be true. But it's I don't know, but that made me laugh. Yeah, <laughs> but you know they need to be. It's a it's a recurring problem, I think. Still, all these years later, is they need to be allowed to be as bad as the worst thing with a lot of fucking <laughs> white men sitting around talking shit. Yes, um, I haven't. I also haven't seen. Um, I've seen the original, but I've never seen Penny Marshall's remake of The Bishop's Wife. Have you seen The Preacher's right. Wife? This was uh, no. Denzel Washington and uh, Whitney Houston remake of the. Have you seen the original, sir? I've seen neither. Yeah. If I'm oh right, okay. Fair enough. No. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, Fun catch up sort of Christmassy that'll work. <laughs> if you, okay. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> but yeah, so beyond that, um 
So that was the, the aftermath in terms of her acting career. Um, for the Bodyguard itself, this this then became one of these films that got adapted into uh, a musical, and it was stage mm. musical version, which becomes more of a jukebox musical. So it's not just the songs that are in the film; it kind of finds a way to incorporate all uh, Whitney Houston's songs, biggest songs. Um, I haven't seen it, but it sounds hilarious that after they go through the emotions <laughs> of the melodrama, is that for the encore, everyone comes out and does what's described as a spectacular rendition of "I Want to Dance with Somebody." Lovely. <laughs> and all I, when they say everybody comes out, I just want it to be like the dead hitman <laughs> and the soccer <laughs> coming out with like bloody chests just bouncing around. That just do, be- doing the back and vocals, leaning, and every once in a while, going dance. I can kind of see how this would work because we've talked about how the the crazy stalker or the person we think is the crazy stalker isn't the main villain. Uh, You might say, Mark, that what he's doing is not right, but it's okay. Oh, God. I mean, we should have done more of those. You know, we should have found ways to work more subtitles in this. Bravo. <laughs> that was such a mark move. That was... <laughs> um, so the other thing that happened as well is, um, there was, have you ever heard about the mooted sequel? No, I have. The remake? You've, you've got to tell the listeners, yes. Okay, so um, after this came out, there was at one point Kevin Costner was in the... He's never done sequels, by the way. Like up until it took up until this kind of recurring role. Like for some reason, he's in the subsequent Zack Snyder DC films, even though ah, his character dies yes. in Man of Steel. He just keeps popping up as a ghost to tell Superman, hmm, "Helping people, is it? I tried helping someone once. <laughs> and I still hear the screams when I close my eyes. Shit like that." Anyway, so other than that, he's never done sequels, but he was working on developing The Bodyguard too. Um, and he, he sort of went down the same road. He was going for someone who. who who wasn't established as an actor, and who he reached out to was Princess Diana. Um, I mean, the the first thing you've got to say is this guy's a shit bodyguard. Everyone he guards <laughs> dies. <laughs> God. Well, the thing was, this was so he had conversations with Diana about this, about mm. the idea of her going into acting, and she was reportedly game for it. Um, but the first draft of the script came across his desk the day before she died. Um, so according to, according to Costner, um, it just sat there. He didn't read it, didn't do anything, couldn't do anything with it. Um, no, like, oh, if we're not letting it, oh, we can't do that now. It just sort of, you know, it was... But that's one of those odd film facts that's just... That's just bizarre. That's just an absolute... It's strange, isn't it, Absolutely. that no one ever talks about the Bodyguard franchise, as I guess it is now with the musical. Mm. No one ever talks about it as a sort of cursed film, I guess because, again, it's not really the right genre, isn't it? As, as soon as someone mm. stubs their toe on the set of a film about the devil, everyone's like, oh, it's cursed, but mm. the Bodyguard <laughs> movie franchise can have a 100% success rate yeah. In female leads who die tragically young, and everyone's like, "Ah, oh, shit happens." <sighs> Woof. Um, so getting around to the remake thing, which I keep saying I'm going to come back mm. to because this is the thing. This isn't my observation. It's something I was vaguely thought, and someone then said it, so I couldn't do a feature on it like I wanted to. But um, you know how we get um, versions of A Star Is Born every twenty years, except yes. for the nineties. Yeah, because this was tied up. You know, at the time that this was being made, the remake, the planned remake of A Star Is Born for the nineties, was um, in development hell thanks to a person we've mentioned on this podcast before, Bradley <laughs> Cooper. To Bradley no, Cooper. Um, yes. John, John, Peters, <laughs> John Peters, as played by Bradley Cooper, who had a stake in A Star Is Born because of his relationship to Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, this was in development hell throughout throughout the nineties. But someone observed that this is more or less just sort of slots into that sort of space. Yes. There. And that going forward, it will maybe alternate between remakes of A Star is Born and The Bodyguard, because they both sort of fit. As much as one is very different from the other, The Bodyguard is a more violent and action-packed film than A Star mm. is Born, by you know by dint of A Star is Born not being an action film. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's this thing where I think it could come back around and it could evolve because it can evolve with, for all the reasons we've talked about, like Twitter and Funko Pops and the stuff they can do now. And I think it's one of those films that's held in such esteem it's an, they're talking about doing it, but it's, um, it seems inevitable anyway, even if it wasn't already in some oh, some yeah. states. Yeah. Um. So according to Variety, they've looked at various um, 
the uh, Warner Brothers have been looking at various different pairings, like Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson are apparently interested in doing it. They, they said, oh, they'd be up for that, but in that sort of way where they're asked a loaded question and the answer becomes a headline no matter what it is. Yeah, the, the, yeah. those questions should be properly interpreted as we are very jet-lagged. Yeah, um, much more fitting, I would think. Just when I read this, I was like, yeah, I could see that more. Um, Channing Tatum and Cardi B. Jesus, I've never <laughs> wanted to see anything more. Yeah, Channing Tatum is the, you know, locked in, whoever else they get, get Channing Tatum as the middle I mean, leader, I would say. We, we have to clarify which one of them is going to be the bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could go the other way around. It could, <laughs> it yeah. It absolutely could go that way around. I think at a certain stage, not if they were making it now, but like I, I think for the sort of character they're trying to do here, this guy who like has, is, who loves the huge Jimbo and like braves Mike Starr's character while eating a nectarine, like Jason <laughs> Statham would have fucking nailed this like, <laughs> at a certain point if Jason Statham got these kind of roles. But I see where people are at now, like they're looking at who's the, the costners now. And we're mm. recording this after the whole, you know, the latest bullshit um you know interview fodder getting turned into think pieces of uh, quentin tarantino saying we don't have movie stars anymore this is ah, yes. like but while i'm saying that i think the non-marvel stuff that chris evans has done mm-hmm. has kind of yeah. been leaning towards you know with the exception of something like knives out the chris evans sort of is leaning into that sort of mid-range films like gifted you know stuff that chris evans is yeah doing. that's sort of what you're looking at and i do think that with things as they are they're probably going to be looking for an actor who can sing this time rather than a singer who will act. Like, that's yeah, just my maybe. instinct. The, other, the only other thing we know is the writer they've got and have said it's going to be um, someone of um, of Latinx descent who's going to be the female lead this time around. So, and again, they, don't, they haven't said whether it's the bodyguard or the, the person who <laughs> protected. <laughs> that's interesting. I, I think if you were making it now, the only sort of thing that I can... Um, that I can imagine being a problem is I wonder if he would be able to get away with doing a stalking plot line in the context of quite a, a silly popcorn film. Because when I think about like modern pop yeah. stars and stalking and what the sort of culture is around that, what most of what I'm thinking of is those really harrowing songs about it on the last Billie Eilish album. And I'm sort of thinking, hmm, yeah, maybe maybe people might not be comfortable having something like that happen as a as a sort of fake out in the middle of an action movie. Yeah, I think from what I've read about the the musical, it it does condense down the you know there isn't like a surprise hitman halfway through the sister hired out of jealousy. Which, by the way, no notes on this most nineties of things that when Nikki confesses to Frank that she hired a hitman anonymously, paid him already, so that he doesn't know who hired him. She can't call him off, and she's like, he's like, what was the name of the bar? And she goes, I don't know. I was really stunned. <laughs> just, like, just no notes for nineties representation of, of this sort of thing. Just like when you get so stoned, you anonymously hire a hitman to whack your sister. <laughs> anyway, they sort of fi- understandably filed that out in the stage adaptation while adding in a bucket load more songs. Um, mm. the, so it's just straightforwardly, you know, a, a plot from you know it's a stalker, it's a single stalker all the way through, um, which makes sense. But there's all sorts of other adaptations you can do. Now, there's no reason it can't be made better. Is the thing. Mm. It's unlikely to be, you know, the conversation around whatever remake comes out is, oh, you're never going to beat the original. But yeah, but there's no reason why it can't do something a little different, as A Star yeah. is Born illustrates. Yeah, no, completely. I think there is definitely room to do something interesting. And I mean, I don't think they will go this way because the, the title, The Bodyguard and People's Memories of It, um, uh, so like, concrete people have yes. such firm expectations of what the tone and what the style yeah. of that movie is going to be but if Channing Tatum and Cardi B want to get together to do the sort of Lost City version yeah. of the bodyguard then <laughs> I think that could be pretty great you can you can remake most things by gender flipping it with Channing Tatum I would say yes. like, like Weird Science is the one that should get done like two That's like nerdy, nerdy girls in, in school who love science accidentally invent Channing Tatum boom green light <laughs> that's that's what you should do with that but you know the thing to say in, in case it's not clear is I don't think I think that a remake of The Bodyguard needs another original soundtrack the way A Star Is Born has it shouldn't be yeah. someone doing covers of I Will Always Love You and the songs about it should strike out and be its own thing. Chances of yeah. that happening in this economy under this Warner Brothers regime? Well, who knows? What dares to dream? 
Yeah, maybe Zaslav would just make it as like a reality show. Maybe that's what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's like because, as we know, boys like DC and girls like everything else. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's his diagram. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's that. Um, last sort of. As I think we're approaching the end, so I'll give you like a little bit of trivia from near the end of the film. You know that signature shot, you know, when she jumps off the plane mm. and runs to this sort of like, it's a sort of Casablanca homage, the butt cheek goes, no, no, stop the plane, jumps off, because she can do that. Um, yeah. she's, she goes and kisses him, and there's the dolly shot kind of rotating around them while the music ramps up. Um, fun fact, yeah. the camera operator fell off the dolly. <laughs> while it was moving and had to get back on while the shot was still going and that's apparently the shot that's in the film so good on the dolly operator yeah <laughs> but for jumping off and not being in the shot when it rotates back around that's it does, good it does you know promise a mental image of some some <laughs> Wallace and Gromit sh- shenanigans trying to catch up <laughs> trying to catch up to a runaway dolly <laughs> while, <laughs> while Costner and Houston snuck on oblivious <laughs> That's got to be in the Tatum Cardi version. <laughs> That's made for them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Merry Christmas, listeners, uh, whenever you're listening to this. Uh, but if you enjoyed this, uh, please consider giving us the Christmas gift of Patreon money. Uh, we're at www.patreon.com forward slash the Geek Show. And you can find the other half of Last Fortnight's Second City First episode as a Patreon exclusive on there. But until next time, uh, we'll be back in the in the awkward in-between bit of Christmas and New Year with an episode on Todd Haynes's documentary, The Velvet Underground. So that's something to make your... Uh, your winter's even colder than bleaker, but in a good <laughs> art rocky way, I think. Uh, until then, I've been Graham. I've been Mark. Merry Christmas, everybody. Nice.